Hello and welcome to Rights and Recourse, a program that tackles legal issues, bringing you information and analysis. My name is Dumila Matez. Remember, you can also be part of our discussion today by tweeting us at Rights Recourse or calling our studio line on 0171745497 or 5498. Alternatively, email your thoughts to Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. South Africa's negotiated transition and its Truth and Reconciliation Commission continue to be viewed by many around the world as a paradigmatic model of a country moving from authoritarian rule and civil conflict to democracy and reconciliation. But it would, however, seem that government largely failed to fulfill its side of the contract. Worse still, it seemed that there was no political appetite to charge and bring to justice those who did not apply for amnesty or who did but fail to meet the criteria set out. The decision by the National Prosecuting Authority to press charges against those responsible for Noctula, Noctula Similana's disappearance 33 years ago is viewed in many quarters with suspicion. Today on Rights and Recourse, we take a look at this case and those of many others who disappeared without a trace. To discuss this issue, we are joined in the studio by Ms. Temi Silengadi Meng, younger sister to Noctula, Ms. Yasmin Suka, former TRC Commissioner and Director of the Foundation for Human Rights, and on the line from Pretoria, we will be joined by Mr. Luvuyam Farku, spokesperson for the National Prosecuting Authority. I would like to also to thank Simpu and Zaumbi for sitting in for me over the last two weeks. First of all, I, I think let me start with uh, you, uh, Ms. Gadming. What prompted the court action against the National Prosecuting Authority in respect of Nogutula's uh, case? Well, I think what prompted the case is the family's plea for justice uh, and nothing more than that that we wanted uh, justice in Noctula's name to be served, so that as a family we could be able to arrive at closure, but probably accord uh, my father's wish, a last burial site. The, the, the issues for me, apparently, Yasmin, there are 300 cases pending, and amongst them, the PEPCO 3 and the Craddock 4. Are these cases going to see the light of day? Well, you know, at the end of 1998, when the Commission handed in its first set of reports to the government. We also handed a list of 300 names and of cases which we asked them to investigate, which the TRC had had a look at but didn't really have the time to proceed fully and which we believed, if investigated properly, would lead to prosecutions. Now, of course, over the last um, number of years, I think almost 18 years, we have had a number of efforts and discussions with various um, prosecutors around you know, taking action on these cases. I think um, Nakatula's case is emblematic of the many cases that remain unresolved. And we hope that if we can open this one up, that it's going to lead to the prosecution of many other security policemen for uh, many of the incidents that they were involved in too. But many of those policemen, these are many cases, 300 cases, and many of the policemen that you seem to be saying might be prosecuted, some of them might have died, or some of them are in no condition to stand in front of, in a court of law. Well, I think that, you know, wh one of the things we've also done is we've isolated around 30 cases, which we believe could be the first ones that the NDP looks at. And unfortunately, I don't really have sympathy for the idea that if you're too old, you shouldn't stand trial. Because as we've seen with the Nazi Holocaust cases, even last week, a 99-year-old man was pursued in the courts. And I think these people have had more than 20 years to come forward. The fact that they chose not to make use of a very generous opportunity doesn't mean that the families of those who wait for justice should in fact see that go down the river, actually. Ms. Gotti Bang, uh, you, you have no problem with me calling you Tempe Sila. No, 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 that's my name. That's who I am. <laughs> Tempe Sila, the question is, you were only 10 years old when your sister disappeared. Yeah. What do you remember about your sister? Well, it's first the recollections, which I think are making sense of them now. And she spent most of the time in the house. Of course, at the time, I didn't understand that she was um, under police watch. Um, she loved to cook. Uh, she had wet eating habits. She would start eating a dessert first. 
she was beautiful um, she was very a person who will sit I think because she spent most of the time in the house and she was very much friendly with books she also spent most of her time reading and she was a traveler of course she often the time she will find and I used to be a good decoy for her so she would go out with me and come back but those are the small little memories that I have uh, memories have faded as well but in comparison to the other siblings I had I'm the last born at home so I didn't spend much time with her why did you take it upon yourself to champion this action to have the people who tortured her uh, the people who probably might have killed her to pursue that they be charged I think it's a difficult question I don't have an answer for it actually a friend of mine called and said where do you get the guts I'm not sure where do I get them but I think I didn't have anybody else to pass the buck on Noctula was first born the brother who came after us just passed on last year um, but also he was very emotional because there were siblings there were the university at the time he was doing his final year and Noctula had just uh, finished and was about to graduate so I could see in him failing to divorce himself for the emotion and the sense of responsibility that as a brother he failed to take care of a sister because everybody wanted answers from him where is the sister where, where did she go to you know um, and 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 ultimately there was nobody else um, but my mom's mistakes when she is really missing her she forgets and kill me Noctul uh, she will call me a name and say Noctul and then she'll say ah I mean Temsi and and I know what it feels deep down her heart sometimes she will cry after she has done that uh, sometimes I will, I will see that there's an inner battle in her trying to comfort herself and I felt that there's no other way I just have to seek justice on their behalf how long has the family been uh, fighting for justice in Obutula's case I think for as long as I can remember um, I remember myself as a university student. I remember my father going around all the comrades he knew, asking where the cousin Banimlokwane, where my sister was serving in that unit. They were up and about as the family as well. So I know them as a troubled family. You know, when my sister disappeared, she was due to attend a graduation for her BA in Humanities in the University of Swaziland. Even that she had disappeared didn't stop my parents to go and take a chance to probably think she may appear. She might appear. And yeah, and, and she graduated in absentia. That certificate sting ha still hangs uh, at home in the world. So there has always been this pain that has engulfed the family. Whether I'm getting married, my mom will say, I wonder what will she be doing for you. If there's a, a family tragedy, there's always that missing link, this missing person who should be assisting and be part of the family, you know, as we go through uh, uh, our lives. So it has never been a, a issue that has gone out of the family's mind, thoughts, pain, celebration, everything that a family go through. And that is why I thought once and for all, probably let me find closure so that we can be like any other family. Looking through the transcripts from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I know your dad gave, uh, gave evidence. And I noticed as he was giving evidence, the, 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 the interviewer, interviewers, the, 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 uh, leaders of the people who were, yeah. the leaders yeah. of evidence, yes. yes. The leaders of evidence did not know what to ask him. And yes. uh, the, the interview ended abruptly. Yeah, uh, very abruptly. And if you will remember, I think the second last question, he nearly cried. If you rewatch that video, uh, I think he was going through explaining that in our African culture, we believe in a proper burial, where our rituals as Africans are observed. He was very emotional. He was close to tears. I think that's what, just but one. Um, my father had greatest love for the struggle, and I think that's what also led all of us to believe in this. So it will also be an indictment on me to sit down and say, I can't do anything. I have to do all I can until I arrive at the truth. I just want to warn you, we might probably play your father's interview with the evidence leaders. You'll have no problem with that. No, I won't. No, I won't.
Quickly, Yasmin, uh, it would seem to me that there was an attempt to put a moratorium on prosecution of perpetrators as proposed by the TRC. Look, you know, for the last 18 years, I think a number of us have been in discussion with the prosecutorial authorities around the prosecutions, and we never understood that there had actually been a political decision taken that in fact they shouldn't proceed with prosecutions. It's a conclusion we, draw, we drew when we kind of, we, I mean, you know, the first prosecutorial guidelines that were released after we put pressure on the NPA actually provided for another form of amnesty. Mm -hmm. And when we protested against that and said we would take it to court to set it aside, then of course you had another set. But we had numerous interventions. I mean, I spoke about the fact that we had discussions with more than three heads of the NPA, mm -hmm. and all of those discussions came to, you know, it, it provided no, 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 no real um, you know, justice at all. And so when, you know, when you read the affidavit of Vusi Piccoli and Anton Ackerman, what is very clear now that our own suspicions of a policy decision have emerged really in what they've put forward in the Similani affidavits. Well, we'll continue with the discussion around the disappearance of Noctula Similan and many other cases you may have heard, you must have heard us talking about the Papco tree from Port Elizabeth and the Cradle 4, whose cases are also still pending. If you'd like to join us, you can call us on 011-714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Recourse or email your thoughts to Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. Stay with us. Technology isn't all scary. There's also fun stuff like gaming. Lots of women do play games, whether it's on their phones or their tablets. Then there are Africans who are using new tools to make other people's lives much easier. We typed the whole CV on a small QWERTY Nokia phone. For all these and other technology and social media news, join me, Spumelele Zondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time on SABC News. We searched all over for Noctula and we never found Noctula. Even at the border, so we went to inquire if she's crossed and to no avail. Some in Swaziland said the ANC people sent her to the Republic and we went to the ANC people and they denied any knowledge of Noctula. In 1985, we decided to approach the press her picture appeared in the newspaper and one police contacted us after seeing her picture on the newspaper and said he, he knew that girl because he kept guard at that girl in Flagblas police station. And the last time that police saw Noctula, Noctula was ill and she was severely and brutally tortured. Well, we'd like to bring to our attention that Mr. Matthew Similana passed on and he must have died with a heavy heart, I think I'm right? Yeah, he passed on in 2001. Only your mother is alive? Yeah, my mom is alive. The, 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 the question I would want to know is, uh, many people have raised, I've read somewhere, that uh, the people were saying instead of a trial why not call for an inquest why call for a trial well i think uh, one uh, it's very important for us to understand um, as a community in south africa that trc was a, a process which had set criteria um, and everybody was supposed to abide by them 
So in a sense, people made their own choices. If all the perpetrators had came as per the uh, set criteria of the TRC, told the truth, they probably should have walked. Me and you would be talking about something else today. That would have been a conscious choice they have made. But they made a, a, a choice to the contrary. They even failed to convince the sitting judge that they were trying to convince at the time of the TRC process that we can't grant you amnesty on the story. But we have also had, as Yasmin said, various engagements after the TRC. Desmond Tutu Foundation tried to come with the peaceful notion. We visited the Enkhekerk. They were saying they're starting the work to bring the former white policemen. They can't live with their past. We said, look, it's not about prosecution. What would it do for me or my mom or anybody else, actually, if these people go to prison? Nothing and probably more of your money through your taxes. So ultimately, as a family, a prosecution had never been our intention. I remember my father addressed The only us. thing you want is closure. The only thing we want is closure. And we were looking for closure 18 years after the TRC. And I think that's where the unfair part of this story is about. That they made their own choices for the prosecution. Not even the inquest will assist us as a family. One, the history of the outcomes of inquest in South Africa leaves much to be desired. But I also do not believe after what had happened through the toing and froing within the justice department and the justice system of the country that I will allow for an inquest that will be chaired by a magistrate. No. If probably we are going through that route as the NPA may recommend, we will request that a judge chair the inquest. But for me, and on behalf of Noctula, they've made their own choice. We extended our hand and they kicked it. So prosecution is all what is lying in store for them because they did not meet the criteria for the TRC. Yasmin, you, earlier when we spoke about a, an inquest, you said we know the history of inquests in this country. Mm -hmm. We've seen the Steve Biko inquest, we've seen oh, yes. the uh, Samora Machel inquest, mm -hmm. we've seen many other inquests mm -hmm. where nobody was found to have yes. been responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's really important to go back to the transition and in fact to, to remember that um, under normal circumstances, under international law, a state is obliged to put on trial those who are responsible for the crimes that came before the Truth Commission. Now in our country, as a result of the compromise, you had this incredibly generous amnesty offer. And what that meant is that if you came forward and you made full disclosure, you would not be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Nobody could bring a civil claim for damages against you. And basically, if you were in prison, you would go off scot-free. Mm -hmm. Now, this was an incredibly generous opportunity. For telling the truth, you would be allowed to go free. We know that in other countries across the world, people are put on trial and they probably stay in prison for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look, we, all we are asking for is that the legislation commitment of the government, in fact, be implemented. If you did not apply for amnesty, you should be prosecuted. If you ma did not make full disclosure, you should be prosecuted. And of course, when Tembi speaks about the question of closure, it's not just closure for an individual family. It's also the closure for our own society. How were these crimes possible? Who in fact gave instructions? Who set up these death squads? We know now that there were more than eight or nine death squads operating in the country. I think all of us heard of you know, the Flakplas death squad. We also know to some extent a, a little about what the other death squads did. But this particular one, the Soweto death squad, they are linked to a number of matters, not only that of, Tim, you know, of Nakatula Samalani. And so a question I, uh, you know, I sit with all the time is, how was it possible that they could operate with such impunity? Who made it possible that they could travel in the way that they did, that they could lure somebody like Nakatula back into the country, take her in, under in the Carton Center, 
and then of course torture her. Where was, who owned the place that she was tortured at? Where did the instructions come from? And so I think the question for us as a society is that we want the individual truth, but we also want the truth about the political arrangements which made these kind of crimes possible. If you look at the PEPCO 3, how did it happen? You know, and, 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 and that's the question that I always wonder. Are these remnants or elements still within the employ of the state? How high up did it reach? Um, how was it possible that this could have happened without those at the very top not knowing about it? There's something else that I must actually uh, ask you, uh, Yasmin, and that several critics of the TRC process regard it largely as having failed many of those people who were at the receiving end of the apartheid atrocities. And some could not be traced and some are still languishing in jails. Yeah. Look, you know, the Truth Commission is a product of what I call a flawed process. And that flawed process was the compromise. Um, in an ideal world, you would put people on trial. But I think, you know, many, many years later, one of the things we recognize is that even when you set up a prosecutorial process and you look at the work of the International Criminal Court, you look at the work of the um, ad hoc tribunal for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia, at most, you have the potential to prosecute 10 or 15 people. And so you have to look at complementary mechanisms. And in our country, of course, we chose to go the way of let's open the space, let's find a way in which if we have full disclosure, we can actually forgive each other and move on. So I think the Truth Commission laid a basis for the work that still has to be done. And this is very much what, you know, like what has happened in Chile and Argentina, where now more than 22 years after the initial truth commissions, in fact, prosecutions have begun. So it remains, I, I guess, in the realm of what I call unfinished business. And of course, the truth commission had flaws. Um, Nano, I think we are more conscious of this than anybody else about the kind of things we should have done and didn't do. And I think when I, when I think about Nakatula's case, I'm so conscious of the fact that at the time already there was a file, um, an investigative mm -hmm. file on what had happened in her case. And yet the Truth Commission didn't have access to it and actually didn't, you know, couldn't in fact put the evidence to those who had come forward to apply for amnesty because if they had, it's quite likely that you could have had a very different outcome than the one that we are seeing today. T Tembi, what if quickly, I want to come back to that point again, what if these policemen enter into a plea bargain with the state as Adrian Flock did? Wow, it's one I've never expected because I've looked for that plea bargain for the past 18 years. <laughs> really, I, I'm, I'm praying even today that may they have a change of heart. Not only for the Simbelani family, but for the South African community. Because as I've said, I have no benefit of a man who goes out there and lie in prison just in exchange of him telling us, the family, the truth. Our intention is closure. Well, join us. If you want to join us in today's discussion, you can call us on 011-714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Recourse. Don't, don't go away. Stay with us. Get all the latest news from the SABC's online news services on our website. Breaking news and in-depth coverage of everything from business, sports to politics and lifestyle. Catch the top news clips and watch live streaming of major news events on the SABC News YouTube channel whenever. Stay connected on the SABC News Facebook page and have your say on news that matters to you. And for the latest headlines and live updates from our reporters, follow us on Twitter. SABC Digital News, anytime, anywhere.
Welcome back to Rights and Recourse as we discuss the issue of the disappearance of Noctula Simelane about 33 years ago. We are now joined on the line from Pretoria by Mr. Luvuyo Mfaku, spokesperson for the National Prosecuting Authority. Luvuyo, what is it that prompted the, uh, the National Prosecuting Authority to actually follow this case and bring those responsible for the abduction and torture of Noctula to, to justice? Good afternoon, Mr. Um, uh, your guests and your viewers. Uh, we have first to accept that uh, it is really a serious indictment in the criminal justice system that it took a civil application by the similar family to ensure that the matter is expedited. We commend the family for their selfless act of not only ensuring justice for their daughter and sister, but for all those who were subjected to gross human rights violations. I yeah, uh, um, uh, what has, uh, what, what the, I'm saying in a nutshell that uh, the litigation ensured that uh, the matter is brought into the table of the National Director of Public Prosecution, Advocate Sean Abrams. The, an investigation team that uh, was solely dedicated to the matter and prosecution team was actually um, identified to look at the matter. They took two months to ensure that uh, uh, the national director is in a position to make a prosecutorial decision. He considered the national prosecuting authority policy uh, directives in terms of making that decision. And therefore, the decision to prosecute is solely based on what is contained in the, in the pocket, that is, the evidence that is there is credible, is admissible. I am not saying you should actually divulge what's in the docket, but I'm told a docket was opened in 1996. Is that docket still valid? Is that docket still there? Is the information still the same? The docket is, uh, they worked on that particular docket, the prosecution team, the docket is there. The decision was uh, made based on the, on the information contained in that particular docket. I am told there are about 300 cases that are pending, amongst them the PEPCO 3 and the CREDOC 4. Are we going to see action in this regard too? Uh, this court action has uh, facilitated a process where the National Director of Public Prosecutions and the Head of the Police engaged uh, in a process of ensuring that a dedicated team of highly experienced investigators and prosecutors is uh, assigned to all the cases that emanate from the TRC processes. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, the, that, uh, the, all the TRC cases that were received by the NPA, which are investigated by the police, will be expedited in terms of ensuring that uh, the victims and, and their families find some closure. If I understand you clearly, you are saying this action around Noctula's case is as a direct result of a court indictment that actually forced the NPA to open up these cases. The cases were there. The issue is they, they never received the necessary attention due to issues relating to resources, I mean human resources. You must understand that uh, the responsibility to investigate is that of the police. Uh, you cannot make a prosecutorial decision if the matter is not fully uh, investigated. Now, those matters were, 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 were there, was no, there was no dedicated team in terms of ensuring that uh, they focus solely on the TRC cases as well as uh, uh, to en enable the prosecution to make decisions. At this stage, there is a commitment from the national director and the police that uh, those cases will receive the necessary attention. 30 years down the line, or 33 years down the line, and no resources, where do they come from all of a sudden? Uh, you must understand that uh, the, the, the history of the TRC cases is a very uh, long and shattered one. It started with uh, those cases were initially uh, in 2001 referred to the DSO, the former Scorpions, to investigate. Along the line, they realized that they do not have the mandate to investigate those cases. They were further referred to SABs. Then there was the process of uh, a moratorium in terms of uh, formulating the guidelines. Then they came to the NPA's death again in 2001. But there has always been no dedicated uh, team focusing on those cases. Now the issue is to ensure that uh, they prioritize uh, those cases, ensure that the investigators are located to the cases. 
If I understand you, I think you see it. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Scorpions noticed that, found that they don't have a mandate to investigate these crimes or these issues brought by the TRC. And it seems to me you are suggesting that there's been some throwing and, uh, and, and uh, between the police and the Scorpions at the time. I, that is what I really am alluding to. We really accept that it was because of those issues um, that uh, the process was, uh, was, uh, was not fast tracked. What are the issues? What, what, is, what is of Im paramount importance now with all of these cases? Uh, we have mentioned a few, but there are many of these cases if there were 300 of them. What would happen if, uh, which other cases are priorities in what you are doing now? Uh, what the National Director has done, he has ordered uh, an audit. You must recall that uh, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit was uh, headed by um, Advocate Ackerman, who has since retired. Now the NDB has ordered an audit of all the TIF3 cases to ensure that uh, he, he gets uh, an opportunity to comprehensively ad address uh, the, the, the nation in terms of the status of all the TIF3 cases. In my research, I found out that there was something called the Priority Crimes Unit. And I want to know, you, were, you made reference to resources earlier. There was a Priority Crimes Unit. What happened to that unit? Why was that unit not tasked with investigating these crimes? The, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit still exists. It, uh, it's headed by Dr. Tori Pretorius. It was uh, uh, responsible for ensuring that uh, the investigation relating to the TRC cases is properly guided. I alluded to the fact that uh, prosecutors, uh, they were the mandate to prosecute. They cannot investigate. Without uh, investigators, there is no way that you can make prosecutorial decisions. I read somewhere today in the newspapers that you said you cannot make a political, I uh, couldn't comment on issues political, and I understand that I have a, a great deal of respect for that. But many people believe that this was this, there was a, 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 a an attempt to sweep all of these cases under the carpet. Uh, Advocate Chikodi was the head of the uh, NPA for, for quite some time, and uh, he is uh, in a position to. Uh, to, to have intrinsic knowledge of the processes around the PRC cases. And that one was the head of the PLCU, and therefore we cannot really dispute uh, their assertions or really comment on those. Mr. Falco, thank you very much for your time. We are grateful for being available to talk to us on this issue. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Luvuyam Faku, the spokesperson for the National Prosecuting Authority. Now, let me come back to the studio. Uh, I understand that uh, in one of your affidavits to one of the court cases that you had to put, uh, you, were, you had an affidavit from uh, Mr. Piccoli. Yes, look, I, I think briefly, uh, to say that... Uh, the list, I mean, that it's an indictment on the NPA, it's, it's really an understatement. It truly has been a travesty of justice, not only for Noctula, but for South African themselves. And when we talk today, we say racism, this, racism, that, it means this nation has not healed. And once we still have this, I'm, I'm, because I met almost everybody he mentioned, I met Tori Pretorius, I met Anton Ackerman, when he was ready to prosecute, I think I was with Yasmin, the following week, he was removed from his position. He had the file of Noctulas Melani on his table. Was that we, coincidental? Well, yes. I, I could only rule it as a coincidence because I don't want to say it was political interference. But we, we had, because I don't have proof for that, we had only had series of interventions which we have made in good faith with the state and with the perpetrators in trying to find an amicable solution. Uh, for this problem and many others. I think the challenge, the prosecutorial challenge, I mean the court challenge which we took with regard to the extension of the TRC at the time. I was assisted by the Credit 4 family. Um, and we, we've, we filed that court. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to that and uh, as we discuss this issue around the disappearance and torture of Nogutula uh, Simelane, who comes from a place very important with a lot of history around it called Bethel in Mbumalanga. Don't go away. Stay with us.
Born with malformation of the limbs, David lives his life to the fullest. I got this. Let, let me try my own. Got on the bed, then start playing soccer, playing soccer in the streets, then like do this, do this. He can play soccer, he reads and writes, he is even able to swim, a role model to his peers. Look at the scripture. It doesn't say I'm a conqueror, it says I'm more than a conqueror. Join your host, Bulang Mulebati, on Bupilong every Friday at 17.30. Welcome back as we discuss the issue of the disappearance and torture of Noctula Similane. We are joined on the line. We have got a call from Mr. Likubu from Gauteng. Mr. Likubu, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good day to you. How are you? Father, thanks. How are you? I'm okay, man. What is your, what is your comment on this issue? Okay. First, I'm touched by the story there. And I've been wondering why actually people were really behind on the reconciliation line to say they will forgive people who have been committing some mistakes of the past. But now the story of Noctula came to my sense to say people are not telling the truth even when they are given the opportunity to tell the truth. And I'm supporting the the reopen of the case by the NPA to say, let the family get the closure. And the only way to get the closure is to identify where really the body of Noctula is. It's clear by now that she's not alive. And she should be appearing already. And the way of the PRC is the way to go. Thank you very much. Comment. Thank you, Mr. Likubu. Uh, I want to go back. Uh, if, if you want to comment on what Likubu is saying, uh, Yasmin? You know, Nakatula's family started this investigation even before the Truth Commission began its work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you track the history back, there was a docket and the matter was investigated. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I think the state was almost ready to indict those who were responsible. Then, of course, the Truth Commission was set up and that in a sense then provided an opportunity for amnesty. So here you have uh, many of those who possibly face prosecution bringing an amnesty application, but they don't actually tell the truth. And in fact, what you have is a break between the black policemen and the white policemen. Black ones say, uh-uh, there is no way that she could have escaped we know that she was so badly tortured. We were the last ones who saw her and the kind of condition she was in just doesn't, you know, the idea that she could escape just didn't make any sense. Nevertheless, even though I think the judges were very doubtful about granting them amnesty for the full thing, what they did get was an amnesty really for the kidnapping or the abduction. But the amnesty committee made the point that they disbelieved the rest of their version and in fact that there should be further action on the matter mm -hmm. so then you have this 20 year i just want to hold you there yeah. just to go in the line you know you don't know how long people can hold on the line lungalo from cape town lungalo good afternoon and welcome to rights and recourse yes lungalo go ahead yeah uh, there's too much. Uh, when there are too much negotiations, and uh, when the negotiations, Nabando other other cause the apartheid too much, and Lilonge uh, and it is also low on Sister Kanuk Tulam, Maganga Dina, Magakoda Pandi, up until a former and a justice. A book prevail at Matheza, Okofa, Bati, Cocos Tosa, Usendi Zin. So also Snook Tula, a low one Yamalayo, was what by ANC Lee, Ubarapana, Opina, and Goskaku. Thank you, Mr. Likubu. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, 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 Lungelo. Uh, you think we heard? You heard Lungelo? I yes. don't uh, because uh, we, we, it's probably yes. 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 Sharing the same sentiments Sentiment, we're talking about. Yeah. I don't want to repeat what he yeah. said. One of the problems with uh, prosecutorial rules in South Africa is that in order for to for you to prosecute, there must be evidence. There must be a body. How are we going to go over that? I think that's a very old-fashioned perspective that you must have a body to prosecute, mm -hmm. and it's one that we've taken, I think, an enormous amount of trouble in dealing with the NPA on this issue, that in fact, if you look at the evidence, you actually don't need the body. Of course, it would be nice to have the body, mm -hmm. and I think that these guys have had more than 16 years to come forward and say, this is where the body is. That would make life a lot easier. But we hope that in the cause of this trial, what we will begin to establish is, where did they, what did they actually do with the body? Where did they bury it? And perhaps if we find that body, maybe we'll find Stan's Bukpapi's body. Yes. And we'll find the many bodies of many, many other activists who also disappeared in the hands of the state officials, really. Tabi, one of the things, there are several names that come up from the past. Vusi Piccoli's name came up, Anton Ackerman's name came up, and I find that there's an, another name that to me is a very important name, a man who actually uh, brought to book a person by the name of Brian Mitchell, who was involved in a multiple killing of people in KwaZulu-Natal, Frank Darton. How did Frank Darton assist the family? I think Frank assisted us when we met another wall uh, in our negotiation with the state in them pursuing the case. It was around 2009. I went again looking at the police and the NPA and the response I was given was that we were at the door of 2010 and all our resources are reserved for the World Cup. My word. And we, we understand your story, Ms. Miller, and we would like to help you, but unfortunately we can't. And, and the family had to say, we either wait or we continue. But we then are muscled with the assistance of Foundation for <coughs> Human Rights uh, and other civil societies and the family itself, the services of Frank Dutton, to come and investigate on our behalf. Because remember, as Yasmin said, there were all these leads which were left by the judges at the TRC table to say the state must pursue because the version of the white officers was not uh, uh, one that they were believing in. So we were looking at time running out, the development, the growth, and everything. And we wanted an investigator who would officially go to the farm, look at the conditions before you know the processes change or the system change even more. And that's what forced us to hire a private investigator. And today and I hear people. private investigator was Frank Darton. Yes, and the, and the private investigator on behalf of the family was Frank Darton. And he led the investigation. And when we finished with the investigation, which took us a year and a half, actually, uh, we went back to the NPA to say, we have what we think could help you at our cost, because you did not have resources. It still took us from 2011 mm. to 2017. Uh, Yasmin, this sounds very much like as all the hallmarks of a private prosecution. Well, actually, that at some point we, you know, when Frank reproduced the docket, because remember the docket was missing, mm. and so basically he had to reconstruct the docket, and this was after Tembi had gone to every one of the people on the list to yes. try and get Talk them to, to them. tell the truth and having failed that that's when we brought Frank on board but then we had to consider what were our options did we go to court to actually force them to prosecute did we go to court to apply for what we call a nolly prosecute and then privately prosecute them mm -hmm. and when we looked at that option the one thing that was really worrying was the question that if they asked for security for each single one of them then of course that would run okay. into millions mm. and so that became that's the l option of last resort and then we said well what's the next best option and we said either we go the mandabus route and we force them or else we ask for a judicial inquest but if we want the judicial inquest 
we, what we really don't want is a magistrate to handle this. Then we ask for a judge. And I think it's th as a result of those actions that we're now sitting with a situation where they have said, well, actually, we are going to prosecute. And I mean, that's the right thing to do. So we applaud the fact that Sean Abrams has yeah. taken such a courageous decision because we see that as a reopening, really, of this discourse really on the justice option. Well, we'll continue talking about the disappearance of Noctula and to, if you want to be part of this discussion, you can call us on 011-714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Records. You can also email your thoughts to rightsandrecourse at sabc.co.za about this case and many other cases that we have spoken about, the 300 odd cases that we have spoken about. Stay with us. The big news is Newsroom. We also stream live on YouTube. Whether you're at home, at the office or at the gym, wherever you are, Newsroom is right there with you. Bringing you all the latest news, updates, sports, weather and everything in between. Get all the latest news you need on the go via live streaming on our YouTube channel. That's Newsroom, weekdays at 9am, only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back to Rights and Recourse as we discuss the issue of the disappearance of all those who were tortured by the apartheid system. No, uh, system B, one of the things that comes to the fore is the fact that you went personally to go and find these people and you, you, how did you do that? Where did you get the courage to do that? Well, as I said earlier on, I was left with no option. And really when I'm saying from the bottom of my heart, prosecution had never been an option that I entertained. I said the system has failed. Now who are they? I went through. I asked around. I got their details. I went to one man knocking at the door. And when he realized it was me, he didn't open. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the farm where she was held for a period of over six, north six weeks. In, In northern. I looked for it. I found it. I found it has been sold not uh, very long at the time. The owner was just new. I think it's a certain Mr. Smith. I begged him. I said, please don't demolish that house which we are now using as a storeroom because my sister was held captive in this farm. I went into the still zen dam where the, the kettles used to drink and where she was thrown in and in the form of interrogation. I went looking for the ANC members themselves who were in the same unit with my sister, Dumangosi, the former mayor of Egurulen, Sipiwe uh, Nyanda, uh, everybody else, telephone Mpumimpofu, Nelisiwe, Notemba Madomo. I went to all of them. I just said to them, guys, you were in this together, I was 10 years old. What do you think? I should look at because remember I'm dealing with a case I had no clue on so everybody to me was important it was a person who was a friend a roommate of Noctula at the flat the person who last saw her for the last time what was she wearing what did she say she was going to do who did she talk to etc and I rounded everybody up but I must also congratulate everybody you know for their space uh, there's nobody, whether from the ANC, who has closed doors uh, for me. In fact, as I was putting up the affidavit, I will call them. Some will write supporting statements for me. Some will take interviews. Some, when the private investigator came, I'll have to call the people first and ask them. I'm sending the private investigator. Can you please assist? And can you, can we take this? We'll, you'll continue that story. Can you take this call from Tanda, from uh, KZN? And Tanda, good afternoon and welcome to Rise and Recourse. Good afternoon, Dumile, and how are you? Fine, thanks. How are you? 
Good. Um, I was in Timbi in primary school by the, the time this thing happens. Oh, and uh, I'm, very, I'm feeling very sorry because it hasn't got a closure. We were at Tosana by at the time when this thing happens. And we just so wish that this thing can have closure and then so that the family can continue with their lives. Pumelele, I'm feeling sorry for the family and yourself. But thank you, dear, that we are fighting for the family and keep on fighting. We are praying for you. I'm so sorry that I'm so emotional. Thank you. Thank you, Tanda. Thank you very much for calling in. Let me go back to, I, I have two questions that I really want to ask Yasmin. And I was still listening to that story. Probably I should allow you to continue. No, no, no. I was just saying, I mean, they, they gave all the they support. Gave all the, they gave you all and, the support. And the, 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 the story that they gave, though I don't want to get into the merits of the case, is in a way in collaboration with what the judges were questioning. Yeah, because the safe houses, for example, in Swaziland, because we had dual citizenship. My, my mom comes from Swaziland. The ANC houses were registered in my sister's name and brother's name. So if she had let anything pass, she should have started there. You know, and they said, we remained intact for even 10 more years after she had disappeared, until we returned back after the negotiated settlement. So I cannot say the assistance I was looking for, I was denied. There was just one door that I dealt with and it was supposed to open. And it never opened until the 30th. One last January. question for you. A statue of Noctula Similano was unveiled some time ago in Bafal. Yeah. In 2009. Was the family involved? Well, yes. It was the Mpumalanga Provincial Government, the Department of uh, Arts and Culture, uh, the Governing Municipality where we reside. Um, in honor of Hertz Bande and Noctulas Melan, they, they, they built a prison, an arts prison, where there is a life size statue of Noctulas Melan. And uh, the family was involved, the family uh, gave the blessings, and we chose an attire which she was supposed to wear for her graduation, which was to happen a week or so before her disappearance. Um, because to my mom, that was the ultimate mark of her life. Um, uh, and we, we collaborated. Of course, the statue went on to be vandalized, still in a yellow paint now from the statues must fall. But I think the uh, 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 sections of government has did their, have, have done their They've part, done their part. Uh, to honor the legacy of I Mr. just want to ask Yasmin this question. There is also the issue of a fair trial as per the provisions of the Bill of Rights, section 35, subsection 3, uh, that every accused person has a right to a fair trial, which includes a right to have their trial begin and conclude without unreasonable delay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that really lies in the hands of the NPA, mm -hmm. um, that they accord them full rights. Um, and, and the one thing that we, we would really, I think, want to be absolutely sure of is that this trial should take place in an environment in which they are accorded every kind of defense, because the last thing we would want anybody to say is that it's a witch hunt. Well, to in closing, I would like to leave the Similana family with this quotation from Jeremiah 6, verse 14 to 16. That's a King James Version. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. They sh they, therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. This was Rise and Recourse. This program is repeated at five on Monday morning from all of us here in the studio. Thank you to our guests and enjoy the rest of the Valentine's Day. Goodbye.